Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. I'm Shannon Makes, professional athlete and performer by night, casual customer by day, and today I'll be covering some of my tips and tricks for making shoe covers such as spats or gaiters. While I am relatively new to historical costuming, I have been making trapeze boots for nearly a decade, and much of this experience transfers over quite neatly to the making of gaiters. The goal of this video is not to show you how to make one specific style of shoe cover, but rather to give you some general tips and tricks that can then be applied in a variety of situations. Whether you're looking to recreate a specific pair from history, you'd like to make a fantastic steampunk design, or you just want to camouflage your favorite pair of comfortable, albeit anachronistic shoes. Since you'll be getting to know me a bit better through the course of this video, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Let me know down below if you're considering adding a pair of gaiters to your ensemble, and if so, what style or time period you're aiming for. Before I jump into the making, a very brief definition and overview of these terms. The word spats is a shortening of spatter dashes or spatter guards, and they typically cover the instep and the ankle. Gaiters are similar to spats, except they extend over the lower part of the trouser as well as the shoe. A putty is a cloth band that was wrapped around the leg, spiraling from the ankle to the knee, often associated nowadays with soldiers of World War I. I will not actually be covering puttees in this video, but soldiers in both world wars did sometimes wear gaiters, also called leggings, in part because it allowed for armies to conserve leather by being able to create low-cut boots while still keeping debris, snow, and mud out of soldiers' shoes. And that is essentially the original goal of all these garments, to protect the shoe and sock from mud or rain. But they quickly became a fashion accessory and a feature of stylist dress up until roughly the 1920s when they fell out of fashion. So to start with, we've got to find or make a pattern. The least time-intensive method is to buy a pre-made pattern. Here are some options for purchase, although a search on Etsy will reveal many, many more. If you'd like to draft a pair, I can give you a couple good resources, although these are all in the style of the cycling gaiters that were used in the late 1890s, since that's my area of interest. They can, however, be used as a great starting point and modified to suit your needs. This one? is from the standard work on cutting ladies' tailor-made garments from 1901. This one, also from 1901. I won't go into detail on any one drafting system as that would defeat the multi-purpose tone of this video, but if you'd like a step-by-step -step walkthrough of how to draft a pair yourself, be sure to let me know in the comments. It is worth mentioning here that both of these options may need to be tweaked depending on what shoe you wear. Some patterns are meant to be worn with flats, whereas others are meant to be worn with heels, and that will change the angle of the front of the foot, so doing a mock-up is always a good idea. Fortunately, these are very simple garments and a mock-up should come together pretty quickly. And lastly, the most customizable option is to make your own pattern. This is a great option if you're too impatient to draft. Not confident in your drafting skills, find that your leg proportions don't tend to fit commercial patterns, or you just want a funky custom shape. If you choose this route, first start by putting on socks and the shoes that you'll most often be wearing your gaiters with. Then get an old knee-high sock, some cling wrap, or potentially even thin fabric scraps, and go ahead and wrap your leg and foot up, because then we'll use the time-tested trick of duct taping over the cling wrap and cutting it off. It's your choice whether you wrap over your pants or if you prefer to do it on your bare skin. There are pros and cons both ways. Over bare skin means that you don't risk cutting into your pants when you remove this puppy, but it also means that you'll have to add a little lacing gap to your pattern later. Once you're all wrapped up, then just duct tape over the section that you want to turn into a gaiter, trying to get a couple overlapping layers of tape on each section, and then you can cut the whole thing off. I recommend cutting them off in a straight line in the front of your foot over the shin bone, 
both because virtually all gators will have a seam there anyways, and because it's the most accessible spot for you both to draw a straight line and then cut it accurately. Now that it's all cut off and you have this strange shell of your leg, you can start drawing out the other pattern pieces. I won't go into too many specifics here because it's more of a general overview, but look at some inspiration images online to see how best to replicate the look you're going for. Will you use elastic under your foot or do you prefer the more historical option of a buckle? Do you want laces or buttons? Either way, be sure to account for either a lacing gap or an overlap to sew the buttons onto. If you have laces, be sure to draw up a simple tongue pattern to sit behind the laces, whether that's just an extension of the main pattern or a whole separate piece. Where do you want your buttons or laces? They're most commonly located on the outside of the leg, but laces especially can easily be added in the front or the back. Maybe you want a fancy scalloped edge because you're actually trying to use the spats to make your modern shoes look a bit more antique. Now is the time to draw that in. Consider your main design elements and then be sure to add them all in. Don't forget facings, planning how the various facings might interact, and how you plan to finish any raw edges. I'll touch more on this in construction tips. It is at this stage that I recommend a mock-up, although I'm not going to be sitting over your shoulder watching you, so this comes down to personal preference and how confident you are in the process. If you've made a custom pattern and you're comfortable hopping right into it, go ahead. If you're nervous about the process or the fit, making a mock-up will help to ease some of these concerns. Now it's time to pick what material you'd like to make your gaiters out of. If you'd like to use period accurate materials, you can look at old publications for the eras you're interested costuming for to see what would have been used back then. If you're not interested in historical replication, then the fabric shop is your oyster. Historically, these could have been made from a variety of fabrics, such as canvas, flannel, wool, leather, or even velvet. So really, there is a huge array of materials you can use to make these up, as long as it's relatively stiff. These do need to hold their shape a bit, so a slouchy knit might not be the best choice. If you have a fabric you're absolutely in love with, however, and it's not quite stiff enough, you can fortunately back it with a stiffer fabric or some interfacing to help it hold its shape. Speaking of lining, historically speaking, there doesn't seem to be a hard and fast rule about whether these were lined or not. Although if you're costuming for a very specific circumstance, this may not be true. All of the examples of army leggings that I found, for example, seem to be made from a single layer of canvas. The decision to line seems to come down to whether the fabric needed extra support, as mentioned earlier, or potentially for added warmth, and it's up to you whether you'd like to line your gaiters or not. For me personally, I like to line mine because I think it gives a cleaner finish and, in my case, because it helps prevent the leather from stretching out over time. Don't forget, you'll need other notions as well. Besides the main fabric and potentially a lining fabric, you'll need matching thread and the closures of your choice, whether that's buttons or laces, along with either grommets or speed lacing hooks. Okay, so I'm going to throw a whole bunch of construction tips at you, and it's up to you to pick and choose which ones are applicable to your situation. I like to transfer my pattern onto very stiff paper and then trace this directly onto the material. You can use whatever you like to transfer the pattern. I'm not precious about it and just go right for a pen, especially on leather where other options like chalk don't work nearly as well. I also make a little checklist on both sides of the pattern that I mark off as I trace my pattern pieces so I make sure I've cut out the correct amount of every piece. Regardless of what exact style you're doing, nearly all gaiters will have one main, often straight seam, and that is a great place to start sewing. Place your main boot pieces right sides together, and if you're using a lining layer, be sure to include this too. I really like to finish these main seams on the inside by opening the seam allowance up and stitching them down with one row of top stitching on either side of the seam. 
Not only does this give a clean finish on the inside and the outside, it helps prevent your edges from fraying and makes this seam extra stiff, acting as a sort of backbone to help the gator maintain its shape and prevent it from slouching. In my case, you can see that this technique is also acting to hide the raw edges of the black lining fabric, which is a fun bonus. Alternatively, you can use a thin strip of twill tape here. I choose to line my leather with a tightly woven canvas or cotton twill because it helps prevent the leather from stretching over time. They'll still become broken in with use, but it helps avoid the large distortions that can sometimes happen when unlined leather is pulled tightly around the leg. If this is a large concern for you, or if you're using a flimsy leather and need the canvas to give some structural support, you can use a two-part contact cement to glue the two layers together, or alternatively, you can do several lines of stitching at regular intervals in order to lock the two layers together. This stitching can serve as a decorative touch as well, and I've even used it to stitch in clients' names to their boots. Consider backing the section of your gaiter that will be hosting either the buttons or the laces with an additional layer of material for reinforcement. This will obviously depend on what closure method you choose as well as the material you're using, but in my case I run a 1 inch strip of leather all along the inside where the grommets will sit to reduce the stress on the leather as the laces are tightened. If your gaiters close on the side of the leg, this line will probably be straight and you can consider cutting your pattern an extra inch or so wider and folding it under, which eliminates the question of a raw edge here and reinforces this area. If you're using leather and it's quite thick, you can also scythe the fold line to make it easier to fold. Now is a great time to mention that it pays to consider ahead of time how you wanna deal with your various facings and reinforcement strips. I like to cover all the inside edges of my gaiters so that nothing stretches out over time and so all the raw edges are tucked away. In my case, this looks like this. A reinforcement facing behind the grommets, which in my case carries on into the footpiece, although this is probably really specific to my design. A separate facing strip at the top that I will sometimes swap out for a silicone backed elastic band if I'm concerned about the top of the boot slipping down over time. This is very practical in my circumstances, as these boots get a lot of pressure specifically against the top edge of the boot and are prone to slipping down no matter how well fit they are, but it's generally not necessary in most other circumstances. In your case, consider if you'll be extending the pattern either at the top of the boot or along the grommeted edge and folding over the excess. If yes, how will these facings interact with each other? There's no single approach or solution, and there are many good ways to have these facings interact, but it helps to have this planned out ahead of time. Consider how you want to finish the bottom edge of the gaiter. There are historical examples both of using binding and of leaving them raw, and this depends on what kind of material you're using, how likely it is to unravel, and personal preference. If you bind it, Add that to your list of materials, and consider if you want to bind all of the edges or only some, and how that will potentially interact with those facings. If you're leaving the edges raw, it's very common to see two lines of stitching around the edge. I'd recommend one roughly an eighth of an inch away from the edge, and a second one a quarter of an inch in. These stitches look pretty, but they also act as stay stitches, helping to prevent both unraveling and stretching out of the gaiter. For extra reinforcement, consider using these stitches to attach a twill tape along the inside edge. I'm not above using spray adhesive or occasionally staples to help temporarily hold leather pieces together while I stitch them down. If you're thinking about staples, use them sparingly and make sure to test this out on a scrap of leather first to see how much it mars the surface. Some leathers are very forgiving and the tiny hole will be virtually invisible, but that's not always the case, so be sure to check. If you're using grommets or lacing hooks, know ahead of time which lacing method you'll be using and plan your holes accordingly because different lacing patterns will require either parallel grommets or offset ones, much like corsets versus stays, and you should plan this out ahead of time. 
I like to use a hole punch directly on my pattern pieces, which I then trace directly onto my gaiters. And in my case, I space my holes out roughly one inch apart, except the two at the very top, which get spaced a bit closer together for extra cinching power. The same technique can be used to mark out buttons and buttonholes if desired. In both cases, you want to make sure to keep the holes from straying too close to the edge of the panel, as this will increase the likelihood that they'll tear out. When it comes to actually setting the grommets, I swear by the two-part double zero grommets by C.S. Osborne, because their flange is a little bit longer than average, which means it easily pierces through two layers of leather with plenty of extra to fold over on the back side and secure the two parts together. The only downside is that their color selection is limited, so if you're working with thinner materials, another brand might be a better option if you want, say, hot pink grommets. But no matter what, I would recommend the two-part grommets, as they are infinitely more durable than the one-piece ones. If you're using speed lacing hooks, I've heard good things about the vendor Ohio Travel Bag, although they only sell bulk and wholesale. I've never used these hooks personally though, so I can't give you any tips on application. And if you want to go with buttons, I'd still recommend spacing them roughly an inch to an inch and a half apart, and just to do a few tester buttonholes on a swatch of material that is the exact same as the final gaiter. If that means you have to sew a couple layers of leather together just for a test sample, do it. It's better to work out any kinks or machine adjustments on a little swatch than on your final pieces. I always add the elastic as the very last step, because the rest of the gaiter will be easiest to work on if it can lay flat, and as soon as you sew the elastic on, the boot will kind of curl up. If you're using a leather strap and a buckle, this is less of an issue. Also consider how you want to treat the raw edge of the elastic so it doesn't unravel. A few rows of zigzag stitches would do the job, or you can cover it with some twill tape. If you're working with leather straps, this is much less of a concern. Some more thoughts from me. First of all, I highly recommend at least mentally planning out the order of operations for your boots, especially if you don't do a mock-up, so that the gaiters go together smoothly. I personally like to write steps down when thinking about the order of operations because it seems easiest to make sure I've actually listed each step and I can refer back to it as I make the garment. As secondly, if you're feeling overwhelmed by this whole process, take a deep breath and maybe also some advice from this cutting manual from 1885, which states that it's not desirable to go to an excessive amount of work in these gaiters because they are invariably covered and are simply wanted for utilitarian purposes rather than show. Or, if you prefer, you can take some advice from Gustav. The shoes are too big. Nobody will be looking at your feet. He knows what he's talking about. And lastly, let me know if a more detailed step-by-step -step video into the making process would be something you'd like to see. Remember that sewing is supposed to be fun, that these are just one part of your outfit, and that the final product should be far enough away from everyone's eyes so as not to attract unwanted scrutiny of stitches that may be a bit wonky or grommets that aren't perfectly set. And if anybody does get that close and feels the need to criticize your work, the good news is they are very comfortably within kicking range as well. And once you find a pattern that works well for you and get comfortable with the process, these are really easy and fun accessories that can be so customizable. Because they only use a small amount of material, you could really go wild with the kinds of fabrics you use and the way you style them. I also want to mention that if you happen to be in North Carolina, Rachel of Le Bricoleuse teaches a graduate level costume accessory class at the UNC Chapel Hill with an entire unit about spats and gaiters, both the historical garment, but also how they can be used as foundational garment structures for other costume effects. You don't have to be enrolled in the university in order to take the class, so if you're in the area and are interested, go check out the information I've linked in the description. She'll also be producing some gator-related content later on in the fall, so pop on over to her channel and subscribe to follow along with that. So that'll just about do it for me. 
If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to my channel to follow along as I continue to make my first historical costume, a late 1890s historical Hogwarts from an Ikea couch. If you are here as part of this year's costume symposium, the link for the badge is in the description as well as my social media links and coffee account where you can go purchase a Taylor's ham and sausage for the sewist in your life with a good sense of humor. Here is my circus in a corset video where you can learn a little bit more about sports corsets and get a glimpse into my actual job. And YouTube thinks you'll like this video. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in my next video. Bye!